Welcome. We've glad, we're glad that you've joined us for a study of the Feast of the Lord called Come and Dine, and we are in the fall feasts of the Old Testament, which all picture the second coming of Jesus. We've already done the spring feasts. We've looked at the meaning of all of those. We've looked at Hanukkah and Purim and Sabbath, and now we are in the fall feasts. Last week, we talked about the Feast of Trumpets, which pictures the rapture of the church. I'm excited to share t with you today the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, which is the next feast that comes in God's fall calendar of feasts, picturing actually the atonement of Israel in the Old Testament, which we'll talk about today, how Jesus fulfilled that in his first coming when he died on the cross, and then how he will fulfill it in his second coming when I believe he returns to the earth on the day of atonement at the end of the tribulation. And Israel will look upon him whom they've pierced and they will give their hearts to him in one day. So let's talk about that today. So what do you think is the most prominent number used today? It seems the favorite of many of us. Here's a hint. It's the most referred to number in advertising, sports, business, education, entertainment. It's all about how to be number one. two. No. Have you ever heard anybody, any athlete say, my goal is to go to the Olympics and win a bronze medal? Everybody wants to be number one. They want to go for the gold. One signifies some things for us. It's a priority and a goal. So, for instance, in basketball, in March Madness, we start out with a number of teams on the road to the final four. But do we stop there? No. Why? Because we want to know who is number one. It talks to us about being focused, about having a single-mindedness one thing that's most important to us or one thing that we're concentrating on. We like the number one and God does too because when he talked about relationships, he talked about oneness and unity. In fact, Genesis mentions it for the first time when, he, when the Lord says two will become one flesh in marriage. Jesus said it when he said, I and my father are one. His prayer for us, the great high priestly prayer in John 17, that we would be one, as his body, as his church. But we are often not happy with one because it forces a choice when it comes down to only one thing. Then the lines are drawn and a choice has to be made, which may be one reason that the Lord set aside the number one for this day of feasting. In our language, it is atonement. But if you break down the word, it's at one meant. One is in the word, atonement. God's purpose through this one day was to erase the separation which had occurred because of sin, bringing us back together if we would only choose his one way to be reconciled. It would involve one choice between sin and salvation. We have a popular phrase today, what a difference a day can make. Those of us who have experienced a birth, a death, a great victory or a choice with consequences that linger long. Know what a difference a day makes. That's why I believe he chose this feast to be only one day when he would become one again with those who would choose to allow him into their lives. So will you pray with me now that the Lord will make us of one mind and one heart that we would respond in one way, the wise way, to this, the greatest day we will ever embrace in this life. Father, I thank you that you are one God, one Lord, that there is one Christ and one spirit, that we are one body, the church, that there is one baptism, that there is one truth to be found in your word, and you want to share that with us today. Father, you want to make us one again, and the only way to do that was for one to come, the only one who could and once and for all to give one sacrifice that would cover our sin forever. Father, open our hearts today that we may hear, that we may not just listen but see what you have done for us. And Father, that in a fresh way we would break our hearts before you, that we would turn from our sin and that we would embrace wholly the salvation that you died to give us. Father, if we've already made that decision, I pray that today you would stir our hearts to understand the fullness of it 
in a brand new way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's look at this one day together. That's the first thing that I want to talk about. It is literally one day. While the other feasts or days were a week or tied to other feasts that made them feel longer, this is a single solitary day. One day. The Day of Atonement is also known by the Jewish people by some other names. So let's look at some of their names for this day because many things were involved in it. First, it's known to them as the Day of Judgment. On this day, the nation waited with fear and trembling as the high priest entered the Holy of Holies to offer a sacrifice for their sin. God would accept or reject them on this one day for the entire year based upon the performance of that one priest. And just as the nation of Israel was judged and their sins covered on this one day of the year, so one day they will be judged by the Lord at his return when they will repent and receive his covering. Ironically, when the leaders of Israel had an opportunity to accept Messiah, they instead judged him, asking that his blood be upon them and their children. It's also known as the fast. It's considered the most solemn and holy day of the year as God's people fast, mourn, and repent. And as they do this, breaking their hearts before the Lord, it turns into a day of great rejoicing as God accepts the sacrifice on their behalf. And then it becomes a day of forgiveness. So it is also known by this name. It's known as well, not just for the idea of the repentance of Israel in the Old Testament, but it's called the great trump. Because on this day, a great trumpet blast calls the people to repent and return to the Lord. And we see that in Christ's second coming as the Lord shared this with his disciples on his way to the cross. On that day, the great trump will call Israel to return to the land and to the Lord, according to Isaiah 27, 12, and 13, and Matthew 24, 31. In addition to the great trump, it is known as the day of face to face face to face, because only on this day could the high priest come face to faith, face with God's mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. So too Israel came face to face with their Messiah, rejecting his atonement when Jesus came, and will one day see him face to face as he comes to judge their nation as well as the nations of the earth. Also called the Day of Covering, this is where we get the term Yom Kippur, Yom the day, Kippur, of covering, when sins are covered through repentance and reconciliation. And so the Jewish people consider this such a high holy day, and they're getting ready to celebrate it even in the next several days. Now, here's what I didn't catch the first time. I wrote this study and taught it several times, taught it several times to different churches here in America, taught it overseas, uh, in Ukraine, missed this entirely until this week, and I love that the Lord continues to teach me through his word and that he continues to show me new things because he desires me to grow in my faith. And I want to always encourage you to dig deep into the word of God. There is never a time when you will not see something new and fresh. So are you ready? Here it comes. Did you know that there were only three feasts that were mandated by the Lord prior to this one in Leviticus 16? They were called pilgrim feasts of the Lord. But this day was set aside to remember one act of sinful disobedience. One act. When Aaron's sons, we know them as Nadab and Abihu. That's not the way that the Hebrews pronounce it. It's Nadab and uh, Abihu. Those two sons of Aaron offered strange fire before the Lord, came their way to God's tabernacle, even though they had been commanded differently, and were struck dead. Fire burned them in the presence of the Lord. It was that single act of disobedience and defiling the tabernacle that required Aaron to go in and cover everything because of his son's sins. And as a result, Aaron had to atone for himself and his household, for the Israelites, for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting, and all the altar. And so Aaron's sons committed this sin in Leviticus 10, and then the opening of Leviticus 16 says, literally, after the death of Nadab and Abihu, 
Moses commanded Aaron to go in and the entire chapter is about what Aaron had to do to cleanse the holy place and then God sets up the ordinance of the Day of Atonement. Before that, God only references three feasts, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a pilgrim feast that involves Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits together is one feast. The Feast of Harvest, which is Pentecost, and the Feast of Ingathering, which is Tabernacles. But now the Day of Atonement is established on these boys' sin. And the entire nation every year remembers this event. And this is what I want you to see about this. First of all, your sin costs much for many. Your sin costs much for many. Do you understand that this would be like having a national holiday called Adam and Eve Day? Like every year we would celebrate Adam and Eve Day and remember that because of the sin that entered through them, you and I walk in sin today. This is what the Day of Atonement reminds us of, but it, transfer, it transfers that idea of individual sin from these two sons to you and me. This is about my sin on this day, and it's about a national sin of the people, and so we remember every year a national remembrance of individual sin. But the second thing that I want you to see as a result of this is that your sin moves God compassionately to provide a covering. Please understand, these sons of Aaron had been commanded, they had been consecrated, they had been anointed, appointed by God to the highest position in the spiritual system of Israel. They knew, and they defiantly entered their own way. And they were struck dead, and yet God compassionately provided a covering. And in doing that, it became a remembrance every year that God is compassionate in that. Look at what Proverbs 10, 12, and 1 Peter 4, 18 say. Love covers a multitude of sins. Psalm 103, 13 and 14, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. That's not a slight to us. That's a sweetness on the part of the Lord to say, I understand your frailty. I understand how weak you can feel in the midst of the spiritual battle that rages from the pit of hell. And in those moments, I'm going to compassionately provide a covering for you. If you will come in repentance and renew your love for me. Please hear me well this morning. He has moved with mercy toward you when you move toward him time after time. And it doesn't matter if it's one sin. He said a multitude. How many is that? So many of, of us as women get to a point where we think, I can't, I can't ask him to forgive me for that again. I just, I've done that over and over and over. A multitude of sins. So let go of the guilt. He has provided a covering. The sin of wayward sons would be covered by a worthy son, picturing perfectly Jesus. Now this is something else that I had never seen before. Look at what Leviticus 16, 32, and 34 says when the Lord establishes this ordinance, okay? Aaron went in as high priest, and he did all of this one time to cover the sins of his son. And after that, look at what the Lord says is the one who is to do this from then on, on the Day of Atonement. The priest who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest is to make atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting on, and the altar and for the priests and all the people of the community. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. From then on, the day of atonement was established. Who is the one designated to make atonement? The son of the most high priest. Picturing perfectly Jesus, who would be the son of the father who would come and who would make atonement for us. So let's look at his first coming together because Jesus perfectly pictures every detail of this day. And I want you to see it in a new and a fresh way. Now remember, Leviticus 4 talks about the sin offering, which I'll talk about in a minute. Leviticus 16 talks about the entire chapter about the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 23 gives further instruction about it. 
But keep in mind as I quote these verses or as I tell you the pictures that all of this is in those chapters if you would like to look. So each day of atonement was a rehearsal for Israel to recognize the coming of Messiah. We've talked about this throughout the feast study, but you as a Christian need to understand this. Look at what Colossians 2.17 says. These feasts are a shadow of the things to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Christ will fulfill all the pictures of these feasts. So let's look at how he fulfilled the Day of Atonement. First of all, it was a day of salvation. In one day, with one sacrifice offered once for all, Jesus would accomplish what had been anticipated for hundreds of years. All that time, God's people had been covered by mercy until they could be saved by grace. Do you see the difference? Mercy can never totally forgive sin. That requires a blood covering that is sufficient. That's what grace is. God's riches at Christ's expense. Mercy is like a place card that covered God's people through the blood of animals as a picture until Jesus would come and fulfill that completely through his sinless sacrifice. And so Jesus perfectly fulfilled every detail of the Day of Atonement. Again, we see this in Leviticus 4 in the sin offering and in Leviticus 16. Let's look at some details. The sacrifice was to have hands laid on it, putting the sin upon its head before being offered, just as God laid on him, Christ, the iniquity of us all, according to Isaiah 53, 6. The sin offering was to be flayed open so that the inward parts were exposed, just as Jesus was torn open by a Roman whip. Now, do you understand that if Jesus had only been crucified, this would not have been fulfilled? Crucifixion does not open the body and expose the inward parts. And so God allowed the scourging to take place and the beating to take place. All of the things Jesus went through before the cross to fulfill perfectly the sin offering. We will see that in some other ways. The blood of the sin offering was to be sprinkled seven times before the Lord throughout the sanctuary, on the Ark of the Covenant seven times, before the curtain seven times, on the altar of incense seven times, just as Jesus bled from seven sites. Now count them with me. They put a crown of thorns on his head and he bled. They scourged his back and he bled. They pierced both hands and he bled. They pierced both feet and he bled. And what was the final bleeding? They pierced his side and out flowed blood and water poured at the base of the cross and he bled seven times. He bled all the way from the scourging to the cross, sprinkling perfectly as if he was walking through God's house for you and for me, picturing this day perfectly. Remember seven the number of perfection and completeness because he was the perfect sacrifice. Then the blood was to be applied to the four horns of the altar of incense, just as Christ's blood stained the four corners of the cross in every direction. He was still bleeding from his head at his hands and his feet, perfectly fulfilling this picture. Remember four, the number of the four corners of the world, south, east, north, west, it represents the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Perfectly picturing this again. Then the remaining blood of the sin offering was to be poured out at the base of the altar of burnt offering where the sacrifice was offered just as Christ's blood poured out of his pierced side after he was offered. Again, the final moment of the final sacrifice for us. Then, according to scripture, the remaining flesh of the sacrifice was to be taken outside the camp and burned, just as Jesus was offered up and felt the fires of judgment outside the gates of Jerusalem. So, this is a picture of Golgotha today. I've stood here. You can see the skull kind of in the, in the mountain there. If you were looking from that skull back to Jerusalem, you would see the bottom picture. This is how close it is, and that's the sheep gate. And it's amazing to me because that's where the lambs went through to be sacrificed. And Jesus would go in and out of that sheep gate on his way to the cross, coming out and being crucified outside the gates, just as those 
animals had to be brought outside the gates after the Day of Atonement in order to be burned. One sacrifice in one day, once for all, perfectly fulfilling. A day of sacrifice for you, the perfect one who would give his life to cover you completely. Then we see it's a day of substitution, a day when so many things were given to us that we didn't deserve. Christ took the payment, but he gave us so much more in return. So let's look at it. First of all, it's a life for a life. Remember that the scripture specifically says, for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Leviticus 17, 11. Now, it's become unpopular to talk about the blood of Jesus, but I am telling you, it is the blood that is required to make atonement. It is life, a life for a life. So atonement would require someone to pay the penalty of your death so you could live. And Christ gave his life in exchange for yours. Who got the better end of that deal? We did. Let's keep going. A slave for a son. A slave for a son. Now I want you to carefully consider this. Philippians 2, 7 says this about Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, doulos in the Greek. Jesus, not only becoming man, but taking the form of a slave. Now look at what Galatians 4, 7 says about you in Christ. So you are no longer a slave, same word, doulos, but a what? Son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Now, did you know that the price for a slave in the Bible is 30 pieces of silver? 30 pieces of silver, according to Exodus 21, 30. And Jesus took the price on your head as a slave to sin so that you could become a child of God. And what's astounding about that is Judas had no problem selling his Savior for the price of a Gentile slave. And yet in that exchange, Jesus made a priceless gift to you. And you are a worthy son of God and no longer a slave to sin. Then this day of atonement reminds us that you get more for less. You get more for less. This is a two for one deal on the day of atonement. You see, there were two goats considered as one sacrifice on this day. Both will bear sin. One will die and one will live, the sacrifice and the scapegoat. In this, I want you to see a double blessing because when Jesus died for you, you did not just receive redemption of sin, which you did. You received redemption of sin and removal of sin. And that is what the scapegoat did. It lived, they laid the sins on him and he went out into the wilderness because God wanted to picture that your sin would be removed. You would no longer have it near you. It would go away for as far as the east is from the west. So I've removed your transgressions from you. I have buried your sins in the depth of the sea. God made that point to his people. Now, look at what John the Baptist says about Jesus when he identifies him. First, he identifies Jesus as the scapegoat in John 1 29, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And then one day later, Jesus comes again and John the Baptist sees him. And in that moment, John looks at him and says, behold the Lamb of God in John 1 36, identifying Jesus perfectly as two for one, two sacrifices that become one. In dying, he covered your sin in living he carried your sin away and it has been completely removed from you but it's not just a double blessing for you it's triple power not only do you have redemption of sin not only do you have the removal of sin but there is a third thing that you have triple power that comes i think as a result of what jesus did in substituting his life for yours and that is resistance to sin do you know what Jesus did right after his baptism? After John 
announces that he is both the sacrifice and the scapegoat and is baptized and the power of the Holy Spirit comes on him. Look at what happens next. Then Jesus, full of the Spirit, was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Now consider because of Jesus taking those temptations and turning them away that you have that power in the Holy Spirit to resist temptation. That's why James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Christ gained through his life what you never could have given through your life as a payment for your sin. Do you see the trade-offs? And you are the beneficiary of so much more through Jesus offering himself for you. Then you exchange your guilt for his grace. So those who sinned were to touch the head of the sin offering and scapegoat, transferring their guilt. In Hebrew or in the Jewish culture, this is called semika. And this fulfills perfectly what Jesus did for us in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him. Now think about it. When Jesus came, many laid their hands on him on the way to the cross. On the Day of Atonement, everybody had to lay hands on that sacrifice, on the head of that sacrifice. Think about it. Who laid hands on Jesus? Well, Judas kissed his face. The religious leaders struck his face with their palms. That's the same word that's used for the smika when you put your palms on the head of the sacrifice. The Jewish and Gentile soldiers spat in his face, slapped his face, pulled out his beard, crowned his head with thorns. It seems that everybody representatively put their hands on the head of Jesus as he went to be a sacrifice for sin. Some have said, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. They weren't transferring their sin onto Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Does the sacrifice bear its own sin? Does the lamb that dies die for its sin or for the sins of the people? So do you know what they convicted Jesus of and killed him for? Blasphemy. Blasphemy against God as a false Christ. Do you know what they did in front of the cross, the religious leaders, when they mocked him, that word in the Greek, blasphemo? Jesus didn't blaspheme, they blasphemed. <laughs> and when they convicted him, it was their sin that was transferred upon him. It was their sin of blasphemy that they convicted him for. Isn't that incredible? transferring and so when you go through this process of salvation you lay your hands as it were onto the head of Jesus and you transfer everything you have ever done and he carries it for you it's a transaction of your guilt for his grace well then someone other than the high priest was to lead the scapegoat away into the wilderness eventually Jewish law mandated this was to be a Gentile and Gentiles would one day lead Jesus outside the gates to the cross. Look at how this unfolded in Luke 22 and 23. They led him away. And they led him off to Pilate. When they had led him away, over and over it specifically says this, because this is what was done to the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. And then that Gentile was then to wash his clothes and bathe before coming into the camp as a covering for his own sin. And perhaps the Roman centurion fulfilled this role as he declared Jesus to be a righteous sacrifice. Indeed, this was a righteous man, an innocent man. It's interesting, church history tells us that that centurion was later numbered in the early church. Could it be that he gave his heart to Jesus on that day, seeing him? as a righteous sacrifice for his own sin. Then the atonement sacrifice had to be offered by the whole nation, as Jesus would be offered by the whole house of Israel, as they declared to Pilate, let his blood be upon us and our children. Matthew 27, 25. Now, can you imagine, of all the things I would not want to say in that moment, 
would be, let the guilt of this, let the judgment of this fall on my generation and on the generation to come. Can you imagine? And that's exactly what happened because Israel was then under judgment and one generation later, 40 years later, the temple was destroyed in keeping with their request that they bear the judgment alone for what they had done. Then as a day of substitution, we exchange rest for our work. Look at what Leviticus 16, 9 says. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. On the 10th day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work, whether native born or what? A stranger that sojourns among you. Leviticus 16, 9. <clears throat> so the day of atonement was to be a Sabbath of rest while denying yourself. Some translations use the word humbling, some afflicting. It's a picture of the fasting that Israel was to do on this day. Why? Because you cannot work for your salvation. It is the work of Christ alone. Now notice how it says you are to deny yourself and a stranger that sojourns among you is even to do this. This is why I believe Simon the Cyrene carried the cross of Jesus for a short time. He was a stranger sojourning into Jerusalem, representing us, I believe, on that day. Jewish and Greek family names he has in his names. Simon, a Jewish name, from Cyrene, North Africa, a Gentile area. His sons are named Rufus and Alexander, according to Acts, and they're numbered in the early church as well. Interesting, representing all of us. He was journeying against the crowd that day. Jesus was coming out one way. He was coming in his own way because, because each of us has turned his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Simon the Cyrene, denying his own way, took up the cross, following behind Jesus. And then Jesus took it from there because you and I cannot complete that sacrifice. Only Jesus can. But do you know what our responsibility is once we have received Jesus and the fullness of that sacrifice? If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And Simon the Cyrene pictures that in every way. Remember, we do not offer our own works. We offer only his blood. So let me warn you, ladies, be careful. Be careful of any religions that add man or a man to Jesus for salvation. It is not Jesus plus Mary. It is not Jesus plus Muhammad. It is not Jesus plus Joseph Smith. It is not Jesus plus you. You don't get to have a part in this. You are not going to heaven because you light a candle in some cathedral because you pray a set of prayers, you don't get to go to heaven because your grandmother went to church. You haven't always been a Christian. You're not going to heaven because your parents took you to Sunday school or a pastor or a priest prayed over you. You're not gonna to go to heaven because as a baby, somebody sprinkled you with water and said you were saved. You don't get any of that. You come the same way each one of us has to come. We come by Christ alone. Through his blood, he is the only one who can accomplish that for us. And so we exchange rest for work because there's not one work you can do to save yourself. And the Day of Atonement pictures that perfectly. In fact, during the Day of Atonement, all rested. Only the high priest worked. Look at what Reve uh, Le Leviticus 23 says. Any person who does any work on that day... That person I will destroy among his people. You shall do no work at all. God was so serious about that that he said that if anybody did one thing on that day, he would destroy them. As a picture that that's what will happen. If you decide it's your work in any way, you will be destroyed. Your destiny will be hell because you can't add anything to Jesus. It is his work alone. And so this becomes a day of substitution that gave us more than we can imagine. Those of you who are saved, did you ever see all of those pictures before? Did you ever see the fullness of that? Not just a life for a life, a slave for a son. Two for one, more for less. 
rest for work. All of the things that the Lord accomplished for you. It's a day of substitution. Then we see it's a day of solitary service. And again, all of these things I'm about to say are found in Leviticus 16. So I'll just give you the verses. First of all, only one could make atonement, and that was the son of the father, who is high priest. Verse 32. As this son atones, he is exalted to the highest place, just as Jesus, as son of the father, would atone and be exalted to the highest place. Therefore, God has exalted him and given him a name above every other name, that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That son of the high priest on every day of atonement, he didn't have the highest place. His father did until that day. And on that day, he was exalted to the highest place. Isn't that an incredible picture of what Jesus would do for us? And it was the only time the high priest had to be completely alone. Verse 17 of Leviticus 16. Just as Jesus was deserted by the disciples, rejected by men, forsaken by God. Now there was great pressure on the high priest. If he made one mistake, the whole nation would not be forgiven. And so the garden of Eden was lost in one day by one man in one act, Adam, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and would be regained in one day by one man in one act through Christ. Mm -hmm. Then the high priest was to take off the royal robes and wear only white linen undergarments, looking like every other priest, according to verse 4 just as Jesus took off his royal robes and took on the appearance of a man. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. The high priest was then to take two handfuls of incense as he interceded at the altar of incense for the people, making a huge cloud so he could enter the Holy of Holies. Verse 12. Just as Jesus interceded with high priestly prayers for us in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross, two handfuls, Remember, the altar of incense was a picture of prayer. It was the priest praying prayers for the people before the Ark of the Covenant, before the throne of God. And Jesus fulfills this perfectly. Then the high priest was to leave his linen garments behind in the holy place when his work was done. Verse 23, just as Jesus left his linen garments behind in an empty tomb. John 20, 6 through 7. Again, Jesus perfectly fulfilling this in every way. One thing you may not have seen before or understood, the high priest would warn others not to touch him until he had ascended and made atonement at the altar, according to the Talmud, just as Jesus warned Mary not to touch him, for he had not yet ascended to the Father, as his blood would be applied to the altar of heaven. Look at John 27. Jesus said, Do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Well, when was Jesus returning? This isn't talking about the ascension in 40 days, because Jesus appears to his disciples after this. I believe Jesus went to the Father after he rose from the grave, applied his blood before the real tabernacle that is in heaven, as he would perfectly fulfill everything. And that is, in fact, what Hebrews 9, 11 through 12 and 23 through 24 say. Look at it with me. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. But he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood having obtained eternal redemption. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these earthly sacrifices of animals, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Please remember when we did the tabernacle and temple study, the tabernacle and the temple here on earth were not God's dwelling place. There is a real tabernacle and a real temple in heaven. These were copies of the original. And so Jesus, fulfilling this completely, I believe, ascended to heaven and applied his blood before the t- in the tabernacle, before the throne of God, so that it would be an eternal forever reminder 
of his complete, perfect sacrifice for us. Just as you and I will see his scars in heaven, the lamb who was slain is seen in the center of the throne in heaven. We will see evidence of Jesus' crucifixion forever. In the same way, I believe his blood is before the throne of God, atoning for us, picturing perfectly it is done, it is finished, once and for all, forever. All this the Lord Jesus accomplished in one day for, the is, for Israel as a nation and for all the nations of the earth, for as many as would receive him. Which is why it will be on this day, the day of atonement, that every eye will see him coming in the clouds, the one whom they've pierced, and all the people of the earth will mourn, according to Revelation 1, 7. So let's look at it together. We've seen his first coming and how he perfectly pictured all of the day of atonement in the Old Testament. Now let's see his second coming. I've actually written this out for you in paragraph form because I think we get really mixed up about end times things because the prophets of the Old Testament talked about different aspects and we're confused sometimes by revelation. So uh, let me just give it to you in this form. The day of the Lord is referred to more than 300 times in scripture and will be fulfilled in the second coming of Messiah to restore Israel and set up his kingdom. Israel did not see two comings, only one, and so when Jesus did not become king, overthrowing Roman rule and setting up his kingdom, they killed him as a false Christ and blasphemer. God's chosen people are still awaiting the Messiah on this coming day. Following the rapture of the church on the Feast of Trumpets, the seven years of tribulation on the earth will commence. And at the end, on the Day of Atonement, Christ will return to bring victory at the Battle of Armageddon judge the earth and begin his kingdom on earth for a thousand years, according to Revelation 4 through 20. The day of atonement this day is described in Isaiah 11, 13, 63, and Zechariah 12 through 14. When the great trump sounds, the armies of the earth march against Jerusalem. Jesus returns with the saints and armies of heaven, setting down his feet on the Mount of Olives, splitting it in two then enters Jerusalem through the Golden Gate as conquering king. Interestingly, Jesus tells his disciples all about this in Matthew 24 on his way to make atonement for them at the cross. If this was one of the last things on Jesus' mind before he went to the cross, don't you think it should be on our minds today? Don't you think we should understand the things that he said and know what is coming for the world and for us? So then, on this one day, the earth will be face to face with the Lord. They will look on me, the one whom they have pierced, Zechariah 12.10. On this one day, there will be only one name exalted. Before me, every knee will bow, Isaiah 45.23. On this one day, there will be fasting and forgiveness. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast. Joel 2, 15 says, it goes on to say, gather a solemn assembly, let the bridegroom come out of his chambers and the bride out of her hoopah. That's the picture of the bride and the bridegroom in their seven days of honeymoon. I believe it's saying that the bride and the bridegroom will come back from heaven for this day of atonement together. Let the priests weep between the porch and altar with bitter grief and mourning. As for a firstborn son, there will be great repentance on that day on the part of the nation of Israel. On this one day, there will be retribution. Look what Zechariah 12, 8 and 9 says. On that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them will be like David and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. On that day, that one day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. On this one day, God's chosen people will be restored. Look at what Romans 11, 26 and 27 says. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I will take away their sins. Atonement. Well, some of God's people will accept Christ as Savior during the tribulation. And 144,000 will be sealed from every tribe. There will also be two witnesses who are Jewish believed to be Enoch and Elijah, both taken to heaven alive in their bodies because they will return in their bodies 
and be killed by the Antichrist, then rise from the dead. God's chosen people will have been severely judged for their rejection of Messiah and rebellion. In fact, two-thirds of them will perish during the tribulation, according to Zechariah 13, 7 and 9. But the remaining remnant will be fully restored. And then that one day leads into a 1,000-year reign of Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords, when God's chosen people will complete their sanctification and service as a kingdom of priests. And we will see that next week in the Feast of Tabernacles as we talk about that millennial kingdom. But do you understand the millennium is not for you and I as believers to serve the Lord here on earth? It's for God's chosen people, Israel, who did not complete their service to him properly, who will go into the millennium and become a kingdom of priests before their God. And they will completely, before Jesus, their Messiah, complete their service and sanctification to the Lord, to the letter of the law before Jesus. That's why there will be animal sacrifices in the temple during the millennium. At that time, it will not be looking forward to Jesus. It will be looking back to what he did as a memorial to him. Do you know why? Because God always finishes what he starts, always. And that's good news for you today as a Christian, because he who began a good work in you will complete it. There is an errant theology today in the Christian church called the replacement theology, which believes that the church has replaced Israel, that Israel has no inheritance in the Lord because they rejected Messiah. They have no covenant fulfillment. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God perfectly fulfills his word from Genesis to Revelation completing his covenant agreement with us, whether we are sinful or not. And that is good news for you today. Israel in a day on the Day of Atonement, those who have not turned to him as Messiah, will turn to him in a day. And that is their fulfillment of the covenant before the Lord. One day. And then it's about one decision. Each person as well as the nation had to decide to repent and accept God's forgiveness on this one day in the Old Testament. And Jesus did both of those things on the cross, I believe. He cried out to God personally as he became sin for us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Calling on his God, identifying you are my God, aligning himself with God. He also cried out to God on behalf of the nation. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. It's individual. So our individual responsibility is seen in the source of this day, because of Aaron's two sons who had sinned. Aaron had to offer atonement for himself, for his family, for the whole congregation, as well as the tabernacle which had been defiled. Each person had to identify with a sin offering, just as each of us must do that in order to be saved, identifying with Christ who took our sin. It is also national. The day of atonement is on the 10th day of the seventh month. Ten represents government or the nation. It's the number required for a legal congregation in Judaism. It also speaks to our responsibility to God's authority and our obedience to his law. So collectively, Israel rejected God's atonement for their sin through Jesus, and collectively they asked for his blood to be upon them and their children. Look at what Luke 23, 1 says, then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. Luke 23, 18 and 21, with one voice they cried out, away with this man, crucify him. Interestingly, every day of atonement, a crimson sash was tied around the horns of the scapegoat and also affixed to the door of the temple. And the Mishnah tells that the sash would turn from red to white as that goat met his end, signaling that God had accepted the sacrifice. That's based on Isaiah 118. Though your sins are as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. But then, 40 years before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, around the year 30 AD when Christ was crucified, both the Talmud and Josephus record three changes in the temple during the course of those 40 years, right after Jesus died. The first the scarlet thread no longer turned white because Israel's sins would not be covered. On the Day of Atonement, after Jesus died, that scarlet thread remained red. 
The second thing, the westernmost candle on the menorah would not stay lit because they had rejected the light of the world. And the third thing that the Jewish people themselves record, <laughs> that the huge doors to the temple opened by themselves at midnight on Passover week after that time, the exact time that they had turned Jesus over to Pilate. By the way, those doors, according to Josephus, took 20 men to open. They were that big. This was a signal to them uh, to fulfill a prophecy from the Old Testament that the opening of the temple doors would lead to enemy destruction. And that is exactly what happened when the temple was destroyed. Collectively, Jews and Gentiles crucified Jesus, and collectively they will see him return to judge them, individually and nationally, according to Matthew 24 and 25. Every person, each family in Israel, Jerusalem, the land, all the earth will look upon him whom they pierced, and they will mourn on that day, according to Zechariah 12 and Revelation 1-7. In addition, everything will split in two at Christ's return as a sign of which way each person and nation will go based on their decision about Christ. So the Mount of Olives will split in two, just as the rocks and temple veil split in two at Christ's death, fulfilling Simeon's prophecy at Christ's baby dedication. Look with me at Luke 2, 34 and 35. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Why? Because every person will rise or fall based on Jesus. And so I believe that Mount of Olives splits, everything splits because you're going to be on one side or you're going to be on the other. There is no riding the fence anymore. That's what this time of judgment is all about. And then lastly, there is one destiny. There is one day. There is one decision. And there is one destiny. As Hebrews 9, 27 and 28 say, Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So your eternal destiny will be determined by one day and one decision in which you will make a choice as to whether you will live eternally in heaven or hell. I want you to see several pictures about this as we wrap up today. First of all, two swords. I've never understood this pa passage, and now I think I'm beginning to get it. Look at what Jesus told his disciples in Luke 22, 35 through 38, before he went to the cross. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? And the disciples said, no, nothing. We lacked nothing. He said to them, but now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replied. Two swords? I, I've never been able to get over the two swords. What in the world does that mean? We know that, that Jesus wasn't advocating the disciples' fight on his behalf because we know what happened when that happened. But consider this. Everyone unified to fight against God's plan that day. Look at what Luke 23, 12 says. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day. For before they had been at enmity with each other. They hated each other, but they became friends on the day. They sealed the fate of Jesus. So did the Pharisees with the Herodians, Judas, the Zealot with the governing officials, religious leaders with political leaders, bands of soldiers who came together, the mob, all unified against the plan of God. And one day it will happen again in Armageddon as all unify to fight against the Lamb. So what are the two swords? I think Jesus was saying one was so the disciples would be prepared for persecution, but Christ will be the only one to carry a sword at his return. Because the book of Revelation says that when the Lord comes back riding on that white horse, he will have a sword and it proceeds from his mouth. And that one sword will destroy those who have rejected him. Then there are two directions. This is the sheep goat judgment that Jesus talks about in Matthew 25 on the way to the cross. This judgment will occur when Jesus returns on the day of atonement before the millennial kingdom. 
At the Day of Atonement, the high priest placed one lot upon the head of each goat, sealing their fate, one to the right, covering sin and mercy, one to the left, who bore sins unto death. So it will be with the nations and with individuals when Christ returns. So the sheep goat judgment is actually a reference to the nations. The Lord will divide the nations based on how they have treated him and how they have treated others. I was in prison and you came and saw me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink of water. As you've done unto them, you've done unto me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That will be the judgment, but not individually. It will be the judgment to the nations, which means the United States of America will stand before the Lord on that day and he will look at the United States and say, were you kind to others? Did you intervene for others? And the nations will be divided to the right, to mercy, to the left, to judgment based upon what they did in accordance with the Lord and with others. Then at the great white throne judgment, every person will be judged based upon that as well, what they did with the Lord. Did they receive the Lord? So there are two directions. Then there are two crowns. He wore your crown when he came. That curse of Genesis 3, the thorns, that was your crown that he wore. But the question is, will he wear your crown when he comes? What do I mean by that? Well, you remember in the book of Revelation, it says that when he returns, he will return crowned with many crowns. Where do the many crowns come from? Well, Revelation 4 and 5 say that the 24 elders cast their crowns before the feet of Jesus in worship, which means that the rewards of the saints have already been given out at that time. One reason I think that a pre-tribulational rapture will happen. We are crowned and we cast those crowns at his feet in worship. I think he's wearing your crown when he comes back those many diadems to demonstrate that he has a pure bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, just as he said it would be. The thing I want you to remember about that is that destiny should determine your decisions today. Your destiny should determine your decisions today. So seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you because don't you want to be able to give that crown back to him? Don't you want to ride back with him to this earth and rule and reign and declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in conclusion, what a difference a day can make. It's about one day. In one day, you were released from death and received the gift of life. And that is why I believe Barabbas and Jesus stood side by side. One died for sin and one was set free. Just as Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. By the way, they were both sons of the father. Did you know that that's what the name Barabbas means? Bar, son, Abba, father, Bar, Abbas, son of the father. Two sons of the father stood before the people. One a son of rebellion, one a son of righteousness. Which will you choose, rebellion or righteousness? It's about one day. It's about one decision. Each person makes a choice to receive or reject grace on this one day. That's why I believe Judas and Peter both failed the way that they did before Jesus went to the cross. One was forgiven and one by his choice was forsaken. As Elijah said, how long will you waver between two opinions? Which will it be? Will you be forgiven or will you be forsaken? What is your decision? I love what this says. If people refuse the price God has paid, then they will have to pay that price themselves and their payment will not be enough. What will your decision be today? Because it determines one destiny. Our destiny and final destination is determined by this one day. Eternity in heaven or hell. That's why I believe there were thieves on the right and the left of Jesus. At the end of that one day, they ended up in two different places because one received salvation and the other rejected it, bearing his own sin. As Moses said, see, I've put before you this day life and death. Choose life. Choose life. Choose to be with him. What is your destiny and where will you spend eternity? 
And I want you to hear this loud and clear today as I pray. Paul said, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Now, now, as you hear this message, today is the day for you to reckon these things. How do you do it? Paul told the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's it, believe. Believe what he did for you. Repent of your sin, accept his perfect sacrifice for it. Understand that God sent him for that purpose, that he was both God and man. Romans 10, 9 says, Then if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That's the other part of it. Don't just believe that he died for your sins. Believe that he was raised from the dead and sits at the right hand of God, the Father, for you. Declare this and you will be saved. Let's pray. In the quietness of this moment, I just need to ask you, can you remember a time and a place when you repented for your sin, received Jesus as an atonement and sacrifice, perfectly covering you? A day when you laid your sins upon him to carry away, removing them forever. If you can't remember a time and a place when you took Jesus and Jesus alone, not Jesus plus something, not your work in his, not somebody else's work in his, Jesus alone, I want to invite you to do that right now. What do you need to do? You say to the Lord, I believe. I believe that you came to cover my sin. I repent of the things that I have done wrong. I receive your perfect sacrifice in my place. I believe that you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Just say that in your heart right now. Get on your face before God and reckon in this one day, one decision, so that one destiny is assured for you, and that is the gift of heaven. Christian, as we pray, you have received his cross of redemption, but will you receive his crown of reward? Are you watching and waiting and living in a way fit for his return so that you will be crowned at his coming? Father, I thank you for this one day, for all that you accomplished in it. May we never take it for granted or forget all that you gave us, all that you perfectly fulfilled, sprinkling your blood seven times around the altar so that we could be completely released from our sin. Thank you for the scapegoat of the Day of Atonement that removed our sin, the picture of that, that we don't have to carry that guilt around anymore. And help us to let go of that. Transferring to you everything so that we can have you give us everything in return. Righteousness, grace, peace, joy, love. Father, I thank you that it was a day of salvation. I thank you that it was a day of substitution when we gained much more than we ever could have given by giving our own life as a penalty of our sin and our death. Thank you that it was a day of solitary service and you did it alone for us. Thank you for that one decision, and may we stand on that decision all of our days and live for you. May we express your grace through our lives, and may we glorify you in every way until you come and call us home. Father, it's about one destiny, heaven and hell, and I pray that that would be settled in every heart that has heard this message. In Jesus' name, amen.